Ladies and gentlemen, I am Lord Andy Coyne, and this is No Holds Bar, the show where I ask all the good questions when the camera isn't rolling. However, my guest at this time is Mohammed Ali Baez, a man who I have to say I have a lot of respect for, and I really appreciate. Well, thank do, you. do you want me to have less respect for you? No, I'm just I'm surprised to hear it. But go no, on. no, no, no. I'm I'm very glad that you can come down and join us here today. And I remember when I first met you, and it was backstage at an MCW show, and I think you managed to get your way backstage under the guise that you were with Global Force Wrestling. Um, that guys. Was, guys, yeah. Thanks for the respect. Oh. Uh, no, that was the reality. I and I told the promoter, and there was no haggling. He immediately let me backstage, <laughs> as it was in his interest to do. <laughs> Absolutely. But before we talk about your time in Australia and why you came over, let's very briefly talk about before that moment, because you, sir, I have to tip my hat off to this as a long-time wrestling fan, a former OVW champion. That's, 13 that's, times. 13, that's very cool to have the feather in your cap. I mean, what was it like being at OVW? What was the scene like at OVW? Because obviously, it used to be like a farm fed sure. for the WWE, and then it became a farm fed for Impact Wrestling. So, uh, what, then Ring of Honor. And Ring of Honor. So what era were you there for, and what was it like backstage at OVW? So I arrived in 2005, uh, mm -hmm. joined the intermediate class, and uh, back then it was full-time WWE's developmental territory. Yeah. Uh, so it was the type of environment where you kept your mouth shut, you mind your business, uh, you paid your dues, uh, you sat in the crowd and cheered for the guys on television, yep. and you patiently waited your turn to be able to get an opportunity. Uh, and that took me about a year, uh, until about 2006, when I finally got my own opportunity to be a performer on the events. So, one thing I'd like to know is that, obviously, I know you've come to Australia and it's a different environment here, and it's obviously a different time as well, but when you were a part of OVW, I mean, what was the experience like coming in? What did you learn? I guess that's what I'd like to know. What, when you came in as this fresh, young athlete, what is it that was sort of drilled into you to be able to succeed in wrestling? Uh, that's a long answer, but I'll try to keep sure. it short. I learned how to work. Yep. Uh, and your definition of work, I guess, depends upon who you ask. Uh, but uh, learning how to read a crowd and learn yep. how to work on the fly, uh, learning the, uh, I guess, the other elements of how to put a production together. Yep. So whether that's camera angles, directing a show, producing a show, aging mm -hmm. talent, uh, it was, it was, and still is a literal working territory. Yep. It's a miniature WWE where it's the environment where if you apply yourself, you can learn nearly all elements of the craft. Yep. And that's what I did for 10 years there. So I, I am going to sort of talk about that sort of technical skill when it comes to understanding how a wrestling show is put together a little mm -hmm. later on. And sure. I, I guess what I want to know is, is that with OVW, when you're starting to learn about how the, the sort of where the camera is going to be positioned and how the show is going to be put together, how does it affect you as a, as a sort of a live performer? I mean, do you take learnings from the practical, sort of, sort of that, that production side of things? Sure, and I think it's, it's one of those situations where you get out of it what you put into it. So thousands of guys came during my 10 years who basically came in for a minute and fucked off. Can I, can I say that? Yeah, you can. Came in and fucked off, you basically. Wait, you yeah, can <laughs> say it's been a swear it's word. It's better to ask forgiveness, yeah. brother. Yeah, it's, it's all right, Mike. My, my editor's really good with that eh, eh, machine. It's so I hear. So I yeah. hear. Um, but it's, it's Fuck! Fuck! Did he get that? Oh! <laughs> Did he get that? Get that? <laughs> oh, um, sneaky. I think what it does, though, above all else, is it makes you aware of literally what this art is. If, if you consider the art, uh, you can look at various iterations, but television wrestling is a bit of a dying art now that the territory system is gone. So understanding where a hard camera is, where a boom camera is, and how to work to that camera is something that I think is a very unique thing that you get to experience there because they've been producing weekly television since 1999. They're literally like 10 episodes behind SmackDown. Yeah. So uh, as a matter of fact, they're well over a thousand episodes now. Um, and I had the privilege of being on 420 of them, ironically. Uh, 420 episodes. You can, uh, almost, you can almost argue that respect. OVW was where you learned television. Ooh, 100%. You know, because you'd have these guys who were incredible talents, they get signed to contracts, and then they go, and it's like, okay, well, you can work. 
but you don't know how to work to a camera. I mean, the natural instinct for a professional wrestler is to work to an audience. Yeah, mm, And you will also naturally tend to work to the largest side of the mm. audience. Wrestling ring, four sides, usually maybe three sides if there's a stage, and you tend to work towards the strongest yeah, side. Yeah. When you work for television, the audience are at your back. Yeah. Because 100%. they get seen by the camera that way. You are working to the millions of people down that lens. You don't see them, but that's who you're working for. Right. Just just to go on a little tangent, when I was in the UK, I did work for one promotion who had a show on the wrestling channel. And I, I remember saying this to the wrestlers, and by no means am I an expert when it comes to the production side of things, mm. like yourself. I wouldn't but go I remember saying, I, I will, But I remember saying to all the wrestlers, look, camera's that way, pose that, you know, do, do your, th your gimmick in that direction. Literally only one wrestler on the entire show play to the camera. Sure. They're too worried about getting their shit in. Well, and, sure. guys, and guys think they, they look silly. Oh, well, the people are here. Why would I do that? Well, that's, you're producing a television mm -hmm. show. Um, and I just want to make this point of, about OVW. When Ali was there, like, OVW was cooking. It yeah. was on fire. Like, Paul Heyman was booking it. I remember, like, when I was still learning and wrestling in my early years, like, there was a triple threat storyline between CM Punk, Brent Albright, and uh, who was the dude? Jet? Chet the Jet. Chet the Jet. And like, it was something like, Punk was playing like a tweener, and Brent was the face, and there was- Packed houses. Yeah, insane stuff. And they were just going around, like, Brent would work Punk, and then Punk would work uh, Chet, and then Chet would work Brent. And it was just this magical three-way feud that they had going on, and it was like, everything was hot. I was, OVW used to get put on their website every episode, I was always up to date with it. Um, yeah, it was amazing to watch this stuff. Yeah, and, and I, I think the big element of that uh, place at that time was the fact that it was a breeding ground for talent. Yeah. The best talent in the world were being signed by WWE and sent there. So yes. being able to, I remember Cody Rhodes' first day in the wrestling business. Um, I remember Vladimir Kozlov. Uh, I took a lot of bumps for that hey, guy. I was a, uh, I was a mob for Vladimir. Yeah, you and me both. I still am. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, Dolph Ziggler, uh, yeah. when he started in the business. Um, so, so many people that have gone on to do some wonderful things were in that same environment at that time. So it was an invaluable um, opportunity, let alone the fact that you've got guys like uh, Robert Gibson of the Rock and Roll Express, uh, Joey Mercury, Rip Rogers, Al Snow, that are literally tearing apart everything you do yep. to make you better. Mm -hmm. And you're either the type of talent with the mindset of you take that feedback on yep. and you improve, or you do the yeah but, yeah but, where you know those people don't very last very long in the business. I have so many opportunities to sort of jump ahead in the questions that I had in mind, and, I, and I'm going to do it here. So. Do you find with some of the Australian wrestling talent that there's a bit of a uh, resistance to critical feedback? You're trying to get me heat already? We're only yeah. five minutes into this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I need likes, bruh. <laughs> uh, no, I, would, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't okay. say that it's an Australian thing. Okay. Because um, when I first, uh, I came here in, I think, 2009 for the first time for a tour. Uh, came back in 2011 and then again in 2013 where I ended up meeting my future wife, uh, who's now my wife, um, yep. and why I live here. Uh, and I remember- She's a beautiful woman, and you have guys have great cats. Thank you. Have you seen her ass? No, I'm a gentleman. It'll make you move across the world, trust me. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, I love you, honey. She knows, she knows. Uh, the, uh, the thing that really struck me, especially when, when I moved here, because I didn't know there was a vibrant wrestling scene. Uh, and I literally, I moved for a woman I loved, and it ended up being the worst possible time because it was right when uh, the industry flipped on itself. Yep. And now all of a sudden, people who had a passion for wrestling formerly were treated like pariahs by the big companies. And then all of a sudden, when Johnny Ace was out and Triple H came in, dramatic change in the landscape. Uh, and then less than a year later, I moved here and realized, oh, I made a big fucking mistake. But nonetheless, it is what it is. Um, I was struck by the amount of talent. I remember yeah. uh, in 2015, when I first moved here, uh, I was here for a week before I went to my wedding, and I just looked up wrestling shows on Facebook, saw that MCW had a show, I yeah. went. 
which is the time that we first met. Indeed. And uh, I bought a ticket. My wife bought a ticket. We sat there. And it wasn't until match three, Travis Banks and Dowie James, that I was so blown away by what I saw from the production to the talent to the athleticism that I literally went to the kid at the front desk and said, hey, this is my name, this is who I'm with, and I want to speak to the promoter. Yeah. And then I met the promoter, uh, like, literally five minutes later. Was this the show when you were sitting right behind me? Or was uh, that the following show? It was, no. This would have absolutely been the show where I put you on the spot and asked you to cut a one-minute promo for me yes, on camera. Did. <laughs> so, oh, I remember that yeah. gimmick. I think I did that with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good gimmick. I really enjoyed that opportunity. to. And actually, I should say that what I really liked is that you kind of go, okay, I want you to hype a match. Mm -hmm. And I think you gave me a sort of a, a fictional match. Mm -hmm. And you said, you've got to talk exactly for two minutes and 30 seconds, and I'm going to count you down. Yep. One of the hardest things, I really enjoyed it. One of the hardest Almost things like I did. Almost like it's television. The reason right? why the reason why I love that is because like that's the, when he says it's television. It's exactly right. Like every yeah. minute counts, every second counts, and like that's what he learned at OVW. When you get told you're having a five minute match, you are having a five minute yeah. match. And that's curtain to curtain. Yeah. That's not. That yeah, is not, oh yeah, five minutes plus yeah. entrances. No, 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 no. I have seen you backstage where you say, you guys have got 10 minutes. The minute it goes into 11 minute 30 and they haven't finished the match, and you're like, son of a bitch. <laughs> it's sort of like there's that frustration. Sure. And I get that, because at the end of the day, if you're from a background where television is, is involved, timing is important. Yeah. And actually, going back to the UK, I've been involved in so many shows where some cheeky bugger has gone, I'm just going to add an extra 10, 15 minutes to my match at the end of the right. day. Yeah. But I should say, the first time I met you, I want to say this quickly to camera, is that you, were, you introduced yourself to MCW and myself, and you were a part of Global Force Wrestling at the time. Yep. And at a time, there was a lot of rumbling about Global Force Wrestling. They had all the potential in the world to generally be a, a genuine alternative. An alternative. Yeah, and, and I mean that genuinely, mm -hmm. a genuine alternative. And you were standing, sitting behind me and Travis Houston, my mm. co-commentator. I don't think I've ever felt so nervous in my life to be commentating in my life. And I swear <laughs> to God, I turn around and there's this guy behind me with this one bug eye looking at me going, well, what's he going to say now? So no, it was a really lovely pleasure to meet you at that time. And this kind of moves nicely into, how did you get involved with Global Force Wrestling? How did that come about? Uh, ironically, I took a uh, booking about in Tennessee uh, for a friend of mine who was a promoter and this was around the time where I guess Jeff Jarrett was interested in starting this company yep. and he was going around all sorts of indies and just watching guys yeah so uh, I prepared a packet knowing that he would be there um, I was in a tag team match with uh, uh, my partner was literally a big body guy who had no experience whatsoever it was we were the same ethnicity so I could put a towel on his head and you know yeah, sure. bring him out to the ring with me uh, and we, I worked against a guy named Sean Schultz, uh, who was a hell of a worker. And the draw for the show was a former University of Tennessee football player. Mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee football is huge there. He had never been in the ring before, ever. He was supposed to come at 5 o'clock so that I could go through some stuff with him. He didn't show up until 7.30. So this was the hand I was dealt. Yep. And Jeff Jarrett was watching. And I carried this fucking guy for a 15-minute match and popped the house. So, based on that, uh, afterward I gave my packet to Jeff and he pulled me aside. We have a half an hour conversation and a couple weeks later he called me. And that's, that's when I told him, well, thank you, Jeff, but I'm, as a matter of fact, moving to Australia. And then we had a second conversation because he recognized an opportunity because he yep. had uh, plans on trying to create uh, a system where he would do se uh, seasons of television in different areas. Yep. So my remit was basically go survey the land, see what's going on down there, uh, create a talent database, and send it to me so that we know who to use when we come there. Yeah. Uh, so like yourself, like Slade Mercer, like pretty much everybody in town in 2015, I put them on camera, I created talent profiles, and I sent them to Sanjay Dutt, who was our talent yeah. relations guy, and uh, Jeff, so that they could review this stuff. Now, ultimately nothing ever came of that stuff, but we ended up using that same thing when we promoted House of Hardcore uh, a little bit later. Which you didn't book me on. No. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you booked me. Actually, actually, no. Actually, I, got, I got heat from guys that we did book because they weren't featured in a singles match. So listen, in I'm just a heat talent magnet, brother. database, my yeah. His talent, talent database. Me. No, no. In credit, you did actually try and book me for one small thing, but I think and I was, you blew me off. And I blew you off. I right. think I think my my wife wanted me to marry her at that time, which might have been a good. Oh, uh, marriage oh, risk. Oh, come on. Come on. And what is she? No, what I she, remember that. She's about to have a child now. Oh. Yeah. No, no, no. That, it, that was the most magical and destructive time of my life. So I had to go to England twice. Sorry, my wife doesn't watch this. So I had to go to England <laughs> twice. First time was to register intent to marry in England. That's when I had to blow you off. Mm. I then got a call. Uh, from Roan Herb Street and I was asked to interview Sasha Banks when she came over and I said I've got to marry my wife on that day and it was like and I never got those Just opportunities oh, again. Oh, man, Bernie Bridges like, left and right. See you later. Yeah. It's like, here's the no. flame for her. Nah, big X <laughs> next to your name. But okay so I mean you must have been quite disappointed when Global Force Wrestling didn't take off in the way that oh. well we I'd say we had hoped. That's a that's an understatement because yeah. the global force opportunity came around at a at a time where I had been putting in ten years and when I say ten years I don't mean like training once a week I mean literally my entire life was professional wrestling uh, five days a week I'm working I'm training I'm producing television so on and so forth so I had applied my craft for the longest time this opportunity came along. Because of the nature of the opportunity, I felt like it was viable for me to stay in the industry full time and move here to be with my wife. And when that went away, all of a sudden, I found myself in a strange land with no full time industry and no ability to work. So it was a hell of a mental adjustment going from your entire life is built around professional wrestling to that outlet really isn't here anymore except maybe once a month. Why well, didn't you mention that bit, mention the bit about when you had to go and get a real job and your CV? Yeah, yeah, so literally, uh, yeah, ironically life moves on. Yes. You go and uh, before I, uh, when I joined OVW, I, I managed a sales team uh, in the United States. I quit that job to pursue wrestling full time. So 15 years later when I find myself at an age in an environment where that business isn't really sustainable for a living, I went back to what I knew, which was yeah. sales. And it's really difficult walking into a job interview where you, you have a 12 year gap in your resume and literally all you can put down is, well, I worked 420 episodes of local television and you know, arranged sponsors and this and that and so on and so forth. It's like, you sound like a fucking bum. Like, what did you really do? So. Yeah, that was a bit of a challenge, but I ended up landing on my feet. And I'm doing okay now. Well, yeah, to the point that I was looking forward to move my real life career forward, and actually, you hit me up and you helped me out with an interview and things like that. Yep. So, thanks very much, buddy. I appreciate it. No problem. Much. Karma. Karma. Hand Karma, forward. indeed, indeed. Watch me crush you now. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, obviously, you've come over to Australian wrestling and you have wrestled. In fact, you even won that championship over there, the War Zone Heavyweight Championship. Actually, I held that thing for a year, and I didn't. I never recognized the little Australian thing. <laughs> <laughs> you taught me something today. Yeah, but in my personal opinion, I think one of the biggest influences and impacts that you've had is working backstage, sort of bringing that knowledge that you 100%. had from OBW yeah. to various promotions, particularly Showdown Wrestling. Yeah. I love being backstage at Showdown Wrestling. And I know at Showdown Wrestling I work as a, a villainous manager character. You're a bastard. I'm a complete wank. Yeah. I'm British. Anyway, but one thing I love is watching you. You've got the earpiece in, you're communicating with the referees, you're communicating with everyone else. You're running the show. I was yeah. going to say, do you think this is something that's missing from Australian shows? I don't think it's missing anymore because my understanding is that a lot of other companies have now picked this up. Yeah. And it's one of the contributions I feel that I've made in this scene in the few years that I've been here. Uh, I, uh, I have a, a, an interest in a company in Queensland called United Pro Wrestling. Uh, and they run it very much the same way there, yeah. which was literally how I was taught to work in the, in the wrestling industry. Uh, so it's a it's a passion of mine and there comes a point in everyone's career uh, we never think it's gonna happen to us but our body starts to feel the effects of all those stupid fucking bumps we took in our 20s 
which is why I'm so hard on the guys today about think about what you're doing and you know you want to be able to be mobile when you're older and you want to be able to save that to when you actually get an opportunity to earn a living in this business your body holds up and you can take advantage of everything that you worked hard for. So I find myself now at 40 years old, uh, I've got spinal degeneration in my low back, my neck is stiff as a board. I literally, I don't have to wrestle. I do it because I love it. And these days I like taking those uh, green talents that have had less than 10 matches and making them understand what this really is. It's not, let's pre-plant 18,000 things and go out there and shove it down people's throats and then say, well, they're the crowd sucks when it doesn't get over. No, Mark, it's learning how to fucking work and manipulate them <laughs> with you. I, I like how Slade is holding back the giggles right now. We, we have we have similar opinions on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. This is a big part of why we get along because we share similar mentalities and psychologies when it comes to professional wrestling. Um, and like the the stuff that like when I watch the stuff nowadays, it feels like. It's like the Fast and the Furious to me. Like it appeals to an audience and it's really cool, but man, loads of explosions really fast together. Like it's, I can't absorb any of that. Um, and so, and my style being a heavyweight wrestler to his point about the body, um, over the course of my career, I've taken considerably less damage to my body because of my style, because I'm a heavyweight wrestler, I take far less bumps. Um, Whereas in my prime, I was 185 pounds with abs. So he was a bump boy, yeah. I bumped for guys like Vladimir Kozlov. And he's not abs. Yeah. They're just hiding under his shirts. So. Uh, <laughs> and and yeah. he even mentioned like his tag team partner who's a body guy and couldn't work. Like he's the bump guy for yes. that then, mm -hmm. right? Um, not to mention he's the worker. So like the general. Um, so like my body's in a different space, but I'm still very conscious of all of those kinds of things. You're also nine years younger than me. Yeah. Well, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean like eventually it catches up. Um, uh, I've got a herniated disc in my lower back. Um, spinal degeneration in my mid-back um, all these types of things but I mean um, ultimately and, and what Ali's able to bring to the table and show these guys is that yes longevity is important and doing things in the right way with the right technique um, and, and ultimately what we both are a big proponent of is telling a story yeah there doesn't need to be a million moves to tell a story in fact a really good story might just have one little thing yeah, it's it's all dependent upon obviously the scenario and, and what you're trying to and your accomplish. audience and so. yeah and and it's it's a flavors of ice cream thing because there's a segment of the wrestling population that enjoys that type of style and good on them they they're entitled to their opinion. Mm -hmm. What I try to instill in the boys is that you know it's it's great to go out there and try to have a five star match, but don't make that your career in your life because you won't have that many, and the fans are fickle. They will forget. You're, you're, it, it's, it's, it, you're much better off establishing yourself early on, learning the skills, so that when you get to that proper platform, you can literally go balls to the wall and monetize it. Because you have a very short window in this business. So sort of prove yourself as a capable hand, someone who's reliable, someone right. who can be trusted. Right. And then when you put in that spot, that's when you start doing the top rate power drivers from the top of the game. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Joe Ryan flips people with his dick. Yeah, it's nothing, right? <laughs> and he makes money. He makes way more money than he's ever made doing like incredible indie matches with a corkscrew moonsault to the outside onto the floor. Right. Like none of that. That guy is sponsored by porn websites. He owns a house in California, Bought which is over by independent dollars. money. Yeah. I was on a shitty reality show with him in two thousand nine, and he didn't have a pot to piss in. So he's a ty he's a success story. I yeah. mean, people, it's, again, it's flavor of ice cream. Some people don't like what he does, but I mean, he's drawing money, right? But James Cornette doesn't like him. Well, I love Jimmy, but <laughs> Jimmy has very strong opinions, and he comes from an era where our business was treated with a lot more respect than it is today. And that's, that's not a right or a wrong thing. It's just the reality of the situation. Okay, so I, wanna, I need to wrap this up, but I think one question I want to ask you, because if there's one thing I've respected about you is that you come from, obviously, OVW. You've got some strong opinions as to how wrestling and training should be. What's the one piece of advice you can give to all the Australian wrestlers, the ones who want to be big, the ones who are already involved, and the ones that are almost there? What's the piece of advice you can give? I'm going to give you a couple. Okay, please do. 
don't be afraid to engage with the major companies because if they've never heard of you and they don't know you, then you're never going to get anywhere. So form a relationship with them, one. Uh, two, learn how to work. Uh, to travel because you will learn how to work if you put yourself in different environments. Uh, uh, number uh, four is, uh, this is kind of on a personal level, but if you hit me up as a performer and you ask for work, don't be surprised if I ask you to come show up and get in the ring with me first because I want to know that you're trustworthy before I invest my money into you. Uh, and number five is uh, come train at Vicious Pursuit. I hold classes there on Tuesdays. Yeah. I volunteer my time because I feel that strongly about teaching the next generation how to work the people so that we can draw money as a scene so that this art stays alive and viable. Wonderful. Ali, let me show your hands, sir. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank Slade, whilst you're here, please shake. Ah! Oh. 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 You know, one time he pulled the fingers on me and then like he deleted it on Facebook because he got upset. And now he's doing it in person. I can't stop. How dare you? Slate, <laughs> calm down. Sir, thank you very much for joining me. <laughs> thank I you. I respect you dearly. Slate, hi. Anyway, this has been No Holds Barred.